If you have a true scary story you want to share with the channel, consider going to AsTheRavenDreams.com and clicking the big button to do so. Also, be sure to like the video and subscribe if you enjoy the stories. I post a lot. So, yeah. Enjoy. For context, I am highly skeptical, but I'm no stranger to the paranormal. I'm the type that believes demons exist, but most ghost stories are overreactions of easily explained phenomena, or simply hoaxes. About three months ago, I started working security for a hotel that was built back in the 1920s by a major hotel chain that has changed hands multiple times and is now owned by one of the biggest hotel chains. I'm not saying which, so the company can't sue me. Now, from what I've been told, paranormal activity is not a common occurrence in the hotel, but some years back, the Make-A-Wish Foundation started sending some children here because, well, it's a major resort at one of the most popular beaches on the East Coast, so why wouldn't they? However, the hotel was not informed of this and didn't realize what was happening until several children died in their room over the course of a few weeks. And supposedly, on quiet nights, you can hear children playing with a ball in the North Tower ballrooms at night. For years, guests complained of children playing ball loudly next to their room, and when security would check, there would be no one there. This has not happened in a while, but going into this story, you should understand that my opinion on the cause of what I've seen may be warped by being told this story. Now, every shift we do a floor check, especially on night shift when I work. At first, I never noticed anything strange. I got a little creeped out by the quiet of the floors at night, but nothing supernatural. The hotel has two separate towers separated by a restaurant and shopping area that connects them. About a month into the job, and suddenly I start feeling like something was following me on my floor checks, especially in the South Tower, which is the biggest and tallest, and where I understand most jumpers choose because all the rooms facing the ocean have sliding glass doors with a short railing in front, and you can put the rest together from there. Anyway. It got really bad in October. Maybe the spooky season had an effect on me, but this feeling of being watched and followed never went away. As the weeks have gone on, I started seeing distorted faces in windows as I passed by, to the point that I no longer look at them. The floor pattern sometimes reflects on the glass, and the mind could easily make a face with the pattern, but some of these faces were further up on the glass or this wouldn't have been possible. When I focus up there sometimes, I can almost hear whispers in the back of my mind, urging me to end my own life, or lambasting me for the mistakes I've made, or even telling me insecurities I have about myself that I've never told anyone about. In the last few weeks, some strange physical and auditory phenomena have occurred. Part of what we do on the floor checks is closed doors that we find open, and some of the doors lately have been more difficult to close. One in particular I had to use all of my strength to slam shut. The ice machines on each floor sometimes make a banging noise while in operation, so I usually attribute any noise I hear from the vending area to that. But sometimes? It almost has sounded like something was rummaging in the garbage cans, and when I go to investigate, I would hold my keys so they wouldn't jingle in case it was a person, and as soon as I do, the rummaging noise will stop. On a couple of occasions, I felt what I can only describe as hands touching me while closing certain doors, sometimes just a tickle, and other times a brush against the back of my hand and even a feeling like someone on the other side of the door is pulling it in the opposite direction against me. I now dread the floor checks, especially after 3am. I'm not trying to make this seem scarier than it is, but these things intensify the closer it gets to that hour. 
whatever they are, they are not friendly. And I think they know that I can sense them. They really don't like that I can sense them. Like some nights, that watched and followed feeling is more like a burning hatred directed towards my existence. Like being stalked by an enemy or a predator. I'm pretty religious. And whenever these things happen, I always pray to God. And when I do, it usually goes away, whatever it is. The scariest thing, though, is the last time it was that intense, I heard something growl next to my ear. I've never been hurt by them, so my assumption is that they can't hurt anyone physically. But they try to communicate often, hence they want their presence acknowledged. Almost as though that's where their power comes from. My grandmother once told me that demons truly have no power, that they're capable of whatever we believe them to be capable of. My mounting fear is feeding them, whatever they are. My experiences could be just me seeing things, or looking too much into something completely explainable. I don't know. This is just what I've seen and heard. Whatever it is hunting me at night, my coworkers don't know about it. Or at least they aren't telling anyone. I am bipolar, but medicated, and I've never had hallucinations. Maybe I'm just crazy in seeing things, but if that's the case, why am I not having any other signs of manic episodes or psychosis? And why am I only seeing things in that one part of the building? I want to make it clear that I don't expect anyone to believe this. As I said to someone else in the comments, ultimately, all I have is my word. But I stand by what I said, and whether you believe me or not, these things did happen to me. I despise people who make stuff up like this, or try to make their story seem scarier by making it look real to gain more traction on a fictional story. It discredits people who really experience these things. If I'm writing fiction, I will note it as such, unless it's obvious. The OP did send me a message with some more information, so I would like to include that. For one thing, the overall paranormal activity has reduced over the last few months. When I sense something following me, it feels less malicious, maybe because I stopped paying them any mind. I still avoid doing floor checks in the South Tower if possible. Sometimes I just have to, like right now actually, as I'm typing this. Now, there have been a handful of incidents that could easily be chalked up to natural phenomena, or just people. However, I had an alarm randomly sound when I pushed a door, and engineering couldn't figure out where it came from. It said the only possible way the alarm could have sounded off is if a person pulled the fire alarm and I was nowhere near it. There's also no way to stop that alarm without human intervention. I was nowhere near it, and even the engineer said he thought that it was a ghost or something. Other than that, we just had a lot of calls about kids pounding on doors, and when we go up to investigate, no one is there, no matter how quickly we respond. This is easier to explain, but I've always wondered, whenever it happens, if it was a person, or some kind of spirit. While I was a nurse training, too many years ago, I worked nights in a care home that was really nice, and everyone was well taken care of. I usually worked alone along with a staff member asleep on the top floor in case of emergencies. On this night, there was two of us because a lady called Hilda was dying, and I was inexperienced. Hilda was on a lot of medication, and sometimes awake and quiet, other times sleeping. The doctor guessed that she had a few days left. She was a religious lady, so one of us staff would be sat with her reading the Bible to her, as requested. I hadn't gotten very far when Hilda said, Brian's here. Brian was her oldest son. Her family were great, regular visitors, so we knew them all well. I assumed that she meant he had visited that day. 
I explained that it was nighttime and he would likely be back in the morning, and she said, No, I can see him, silly. She smiled and held out her hand. I truly thought that she was hallucinating or something. So, I held her hand and carried on reading aloud. Not long later, around 11pm, she started to breathe differently and seemed to be unconscious. Her pulse began to slow. I left to fetch my coworker. I was gone for two, maybe three minutes tops, and when we returned, Hilda had died. I hated that I left her. I honestly thought that I had enough time. My coworker rang her daughter with the bad news, and she came out straight to the home. Her daughter stayed with Hilda to say goodbye while we managed to get through to a GP to come out to record the time of death. The daughter then asked me if her mom had been in any pain at the end. I said no, but explained that she had been dreaming about your brother Brian. I said that she thought he was here and had reached out for him. The daughter explained that Brian had actually died of a stroke just three days before, and that the rest of the family chose not to tell Hilda because they assumed the shock would kill her. She cried. I cried. I think I cried all night. I truly believed that Hilda's son had come to fetch her. It changed my views completely, and I saw the same thing many times throughout the years. A person's last words would often be to say that a loved one we knew was dead had come for them. If that happened, we came to understand that death wasn't far away. Story 2. Barbara was suffering from severe dementia. She was only in her early 60s, and the terrible disease had all but destroyed her. During tests, an inoperable tumor had also been discovered, and Barbara was considered terminal. She had been a loving and wonderful woman by all accounts. She didn't speak much, just the odd sentence, but nothing coherent. Still, we all thought the world of her. Due to the hospital being over capacity, she was given a private room on the ward that I worked in, a psychiatric ward, while she waited for hospice care. When her family wasn't with her, we were, or if we were too busy, we would set up a radio so she had something to listen to. Barbara was on heavy painkillers, and showed no outward signs of being in pain. Another nurse was sitting with her, reading a magazine, when the radio started to play a hissing static. As she got up to tune it, she heard the word, help, come through loud and clear. She freaked out and ran. A care assistant replaced her, the same thing happened. She heard the words, help, pain. Our ward sister at the time was a fierce older woman who could not be rattled. She terrified me. She went in next and also heard the word pain. I missed all this because I was busy, but I was present for the next part. A doctor was called down to assess if Barbara was in any pain at all. He said that it appeared not, until we told him about the radio. There's more things in heaven and earth, he said, all dramatically, and then organized stronger medication for her. After that, the radio continued working just fine. Barbara was moved a day later and passed peacefully. We scrapped the radio. I often wondered if Barbara had managed to communicate her pain to us, or if it was some wild coincidence. Her brain didn't work as it should, but it all got us thinking more about the possibility of consciousness existing separately to our body. This was before the days of mobile phones, too, and no one had a walkie-talkie or anything that might have interfered. Story 3 Doug, a lovely salt-of-the-earth type of man, almost stood on a mine in World War II. If not for a disembodied booming voice that yelled stop right down his ear. He held up his whole group thinking that someone had shouted at him. As a precaution, the group turned back and chose a different route. It was later discovered that the field they were previously in 
was riddled with mines. He swore that he had a guardian angel that looked after him, and made sure he returned home to his new, pregnant wife. And story four. This is a very odd story, and I wondered if I should add it. Perhaps it'll make perfect sense to someone. Eric ended up in the British Navy. During training, him and his fellow new recruits had to run three miles, collect a particular ticket from a waiting bull set up, and run back. Eric set off and decided that he couldn't be bothered to run. He managed to persuade a friend to grab him a ticket and run back to where he chose to wait, so he could pretend he'd completed the training. All went smoothly until the officer in charge noticed that Eric did not seem exhausted or sweaty at all. Of course, the man was watching the route and the runners, and they knew that Eric had cheated. They made him run the course alone, and then made him do it again. On the second time around, he stopped in a bit of woodland, threw up and lay on his back looking at the sky, completely fed up. He wondered what on earth he was doing, joining the navy, and he hoped the war might end before he found himself on a ship. Minutes later, he saw a trio of German bombers flying over him in a triangle formation. After swearing and panicking, he ran back to help, assuming his barracks was under attack but there was nothing wrong. No bombers, no sirens, no bombs. Everyone was fine, and nobody had seen the planes at all. He was teased about it, but it bothered him and made him extremely nervous. He was sure of what he had seen. The day after he left that base to ship out, a trio of bombers flew overhead and destroyed the barracks. I asked him if he thought he'd had a premonition, or experienced a time slip, but he didn't believe in anything like that and had no real explanation or ideas. He said that it happened, and that's that. I'll try to add more stories in a couple of days. I'm so happy that these tales are being read, enjoyed, and remembered. I knew I collected them and remembered them for a reason. I want to share what happened to me this summer, and I'm not sure where exactly to share it besides here, since I don't really know how to explain what I heard or felt. I started working on a cruise ship in Hawaii in February of 2023. I had a six-month contract to fulfill, with an end date in the beginning of August. The ship sailed around all the islands with the same itinerary every week and the ship would dock overnight on the islands of Maui and Kaui every week. My two favorite islands, especially Kaui. I had a week left in my contract, and I planned on staying a week in Maui when the contract ended. I had saved up a ton of money, and wanted to make time to really enjoy the islands instead of seeing them from the crew deck. After nearly six straight months of working seven days a week on a busy cruise ship, with lots of rude passengers, I was pretty over it. But I was determined to finish my contract no matter what. We were docked in Maui, and were scheduled to set sail around 5.30pm. At the time, I worked 7am to 7pm, at the bar on the pool deck with a break at 11am. I woke up that day and had a strange feeling. I felt like I needed to get off the ship. It wasn't just an I don't want to go to work feeling, I don't know how to describe it. I got dressed and went to my shift, but the feeling kept getting more intense. I left for my break, and went back to my room to try to get a nap in, but when I got to my room a voice in my head, I mean a full voice, not a feeling, calmly but sternly said, pack up, leave now, get off the ship, pack up leave now and get off the ship. It wasn't necessarily threatening, nor did it feel spooked or in danger. It made me feel excited and full of energy, and I actually started packing everything I had. I was going to jump ship, something I never thought I would do, as I always finish things that I start. I thought it was so dumb to not stick out the final week of work, but 
I felt so compelled to listen to this voice. I said goodbye to my friends on the ship, who were all shocked, since I never once hinted that I wanted to quit, and they tried to stop me, but I continued on. I spent the next week staying in beautiful hotels and resorts in and surrounding Lahaina. I spent time eating great food, meeting great people, and just generally taking advantage of everything the island had to offer that I could never do because I was too busy on the ship. I fell in love with Lahaina. The old buildings, the history, the feel of it all. At some times, the tourists were a little overwhelming. Of course, I say this as a tourist there myself. But it was just beautiful. One of my Uber drivers told me to go to the banyan tree before I leave for home and put my hand on it to feel its energy and thank it. So I did. I placed my hand and head on its trunk, and it's like this energy just turned on inside of my body. I couldn't hear the sounds of the crowds of tourists around me. I couldn't hear anything, actually. All I could feel was this connection that I never felt before. I can't describe what I felt, but something in that tree reassured me that I did the right thing. Then it told me it was time to go. Two days later, and I'm back on the east coast of the mainland, catching up with friends and family who I missed so much, when an alert from one of my news apps pops up on my phone. Maui was on fire. Specifically, Lahaina was on fire. I opened the app and saw pictures and videos of the courthouse, the banyan tree, the restaurants where I ate, the hotels where I stayed, all transformed to rubble. I couldn't freaking believe it. All I could think of were all the people that I shared that week with, all the people who showed me the best time of my life, and how they may not be on this earth anymore. I thought about the bartenders who served me, the shop owners who sold me their goods, the fishermen who caught the food that I ate. They could all be gone. It wasn't until one of my ship friends texted me asking if I was alive until it hit me. I was supposed to be there. I was supposed to end my contract two days prior and stay in Maui. I turned off the news and just broke down crying. I still cry sometimes thinking about it. I've never heard that voice in my head before and I haven't heard it since, but whatever it was, thank you for saving me. I don't know what purpose I have on this earth, but I'm grateful that I still have a chance to figure it out. Thank you all for taking the time to read this and sharing your own stories. Listening to everyone's experiences has helped me process this whole thing. I don't feel crazy anymore and I know that I'm not the only one who's heard it, or something like it. Also, I'm glad that you're all still here. We all have a purpose. And I think that's cool as hell. I had the dream that felt like a real movie. Like, life. <laughs> but another life. I always dream about the same place, so that's what I'm going to explain first. The high mountains of rock and sand, and it's desert-like, but with water. Some areas have low copper-red and whitish-brown color rock valleys, with giant pools of water inside craters, where highly intelligent sea creatures live. Other areas have soft, sandy mountains that people like to sit on, and watch the ocean, or run down to surf or swim. It's not very sunny, so moss grows on the sand. The sun hits just right. Being there feels good, and I have no idea why. I have nothing against people who do, but I have never taken hallucinogens. These are just dreams. This time I was on the mountain, trying to walk with my sister and some old guy teaching her how to fish. But... I couldn't keep up with them, since the old man turned around and gave me a suspicious, grinning stare. It was as if my legs were disobeying the rest of my body, going the other way, downwards. My father appeared and tried to help me go down safely, but he slipped and fearlessly slid onto something I saw earlier inside the bottom of the mountain. 
I told him to be careful because people said it was a doorway to another planet. We realized he fell onto a round glass screen, or window, about 1.5 meters in diameter, and around it was the mountain sand that grew even more moss around it. But it was a dry substance of green moss. From afar, it would probably look like the eye of the mountain. He looked into it and was shocked. I knew that I had to give up fighting against my legs and go there as well. So I tried to go down carefully, but nothing I could grab onto helped. I knew I had to fall from the sky, which makes me think that it was an unknown force that kicked me into the sky, because I was outside of my body when I saw how I was pushed forward and fell down. Like that fear we get when we fall in a dream. Finally, I could look into the glass, but only for a few seconds. And I panicked. Because it was a two or three year old boy inside, almost fully submerged in water, and he was stuck in a cage, crying not knowing what to do. He was light-skinned with orange hair in a mohawk style, and had primitive clothes on, black animal fur and straps around his arms and legs. The glass was as thick as half of my arm. We had no way of saving him, but we tried to find a way. And then, whoosh. It was as if the glass showed me an image inside my head, of the many people walking in a random town, and it asked me if I wanted to go inside to help the kid. And as I looked at what the other people were wearing, I recognized their clothes and said yes. It looked familiar enough. Suddenly, I was there, but not in body form. I just was. I realized the people in red suits were light brown, like Palestinian. Wearing the red English palace suits that I know of and the others were wearing blue suits, and I realized that I was in another world. The last thing I remember was being with a group of children. They were brothers and sisters, and the only face I remember is a little four-year-old white boy with white hair, extremely confident and talkative like the rest of them, and all of them were independent, doing everything for themselves and each other in total harmony even though they had tremendous differences. I didn't see the parents, but they lived in a good house with everything they needed. The carpets were brown, and they had white wooden staircase right in front of the front door leading to the left, where the rooms were. I remember them going to school with their things. One of the things I noted was something I would have seen in the 90s, but I can't quite remember what. And that's when I woke up. I'm going to start this off by saying that I do follow pagan principles. Not Wiccan, but true folk magic and spiritual practices, and wholeheartedly believe in worlds that are not seen to the naked eye, unless they want us to, that is. I know what I saw and I know what I felt. I've encountered the paranormal many times, as I love to go out to cemeteries and converse with the other side safely and with correct precautions and conclusions. I'm no stranger to the unknown or unseen. I have encountered a skinwalker and saw it with my own eyes. I haven't felt this scared since my one and only encounter with one. Last night, I, 24 female, was driving from my parents' house. I was out of a job for a while and couldn't afford living on my own, but I found one. I'm a pre-K special education teacher, not a bum, but in need of help. I was going to a friend's house to help her go through her first baby's baby clothes in order to get ready for baby number two. She lives about ten minutes away, and I know her route's like the back of my hand, as I have driven it dozens of times. I'm jamming out to Hamilton, as one does. I'm putting my heart and soul into this one-woman show, and truly feeling the feelings behind each character's lines. I'm pouring my soul into it, and I was in my spiritual happy place. Everything was fine, until it wasn't. I'm about two miles from her house, 
when I just feel my arms pull me down this road that I have never seen before. I start driving down it and go to turn on my GPS to help me figure something out. It wasn't there. I notice there is one light pole on the road, and I have passed it. And there's an overwhelming sense of dread that was growing thicker and heavier every inch my wheels turned. And, oh, I messed up feeling. A this-is-not-safe feeling. I immediately find a way to do a three-point turn and get my happy back end the hell out of Dodge. I get to my friend's house and I'm a shaking mess, pulling everything I needed inside. I tell this to her and her husband, and they look at each other like, WTF? Because I'm never scared like that. They start asking me questions about where the road was, what happened, did you see anything, etc. I tell them my skinwalker story, and I told them I have not been this frightened since that day. They were in shock. I immediately did an egg cleanse because that crap was not staying with me all night long and keeping me awake. Needless to say, I was not comfortable going back outside, so I stayed the night with them. I didn't sleep a wink, and I've been up for 30 hours now. I drove home about 30 minutes ago, and that road was not there on my way home. As I'm typing this out, I'm back to shaking like a chihuahua in dead winter without a sweater. Something was calling out to my body while I was out of mine. Thoughts? Answers? Questions? Thank you for reading this far, and I'm sorry if this sounds like a creepypasta, but this was a true encounter of the strange. So That My Friends was a collection of strange, scary, odd, whatever you want to call them stories. Stories that are strange and potentially scary. But I wanted to highlight the strange more in this one, because while some of these did feel a bit paranormal, they also had that strange, unexplainable aspect to them. And I think that really made this video. I may be wrong on that. Maybe you think this video wasn't that great, and that's okay. The last time I mentioned um, asking for topics... A lot of people, or a few people, have mentioned... Heck, what am I... Why am I struggling to say this sentence? The last time I requested topics from you all, a few people mentioned wanting more stories about dreams and strange things that happen you know, in the, in the unconscious state. So, hopefully, you guys enjoyed that dream story that was in there, because that was a very interesting one, about them literally dreaming about another life, another existence. Bizarre story, and I appreciated it, so... Yeah... If you all enjoyed the stories, please do hit that thumbs up button. If you're new to the channel and liked what you heard, consider subscribing as that helps tremendously. And if you're feeling bold, go down below the video and leave me a comment letting me know your thoughts. I'd love to hear them. I just hit my microphone. Sorry about that. I'd love to hear them, honestly. So, yeah. All that said, friends, remember you are loved, you are valid, you are important, you are the best you that you can be. Do not forget it. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. And until I see you again, much love and sleep well.